John Spielman with a video version of this week's um, column. It's not an agony column anymore, it's just a, a column, and I will go back to agony from time to time. And I've called this one Playing Your Own Moves. I started really in quite a rambly way. I was talking to Johannes Fischer, the chief editor at Chessbase, of what he wanted. And he really wanted anecdotes and things. So I started by talking about what it was like to be Nigel Short second in the 1993 World Championship match against Gary Kasparov. I spent Gary with Alan Wellar. I know everybody else does with two. And I spent a lot of time sparring with Robert Hubner, who was really the main second. I was probably the secondary second because I was also doing, also doing television. And... Um, I was playing the white side of Nidorf Sicilians, so on Nigel's side, and I was energy. I was trying to punch a hole in the black defences. I'm just going to check now, before we do anything else, that this is on, and it is. Good. I just wanted to check the broadcast was working, because if it weren't, it would be a bit silly to continue. And I'm sorry about the tiny regression for one second. So, um... I was energy and he was matter, and basically I couldn't really very often split the atom. It just, he was such a good defender that despite my best efforts at throwing lumps at Black's position, often they just missed. So, um, then I've said that, um, well, a lot of chess positions, especially in the early middle game and in the late opening, or the opening, are a battle between time and static elements so the time is basically you can either get a lead in development and you need a target you need something to hit with your lead in development because lead in development in itself is useless if there's nothing to attack and the static elements are basically either just gross material or um, pawn structure if you end up with a bad pawn structure and your opponent and you run out of things to throw at your opponent then eventually you may be in deep trouble even though it looked quite nice for a long time. And um, so um, I'm just killing. I've got a, as you can see, a notification at Chess24 is live now. Um, and um, so I started talking about computers and how basically we analyse through pattern recognition and they analyse through just a ridiculous number of variations. This is pre after zero, our true lord, lord and master, rather than really one of our lords and masters. And um, about the bean counting. And the bean counting is pretty sophisticated nowadays. So the machines, um, they not only count material, but they look at where the pieces are on the board. They have bit boards where they give different values to pieces in different squares. A white knight, which is secure in F5, is certainly worth more than one on G1. And they look at the pawn structure and they add it all up. Um, and then they choose the move that gives the best minimum minimum value. So they maximise the minimum, is what they actually do in order to choose a move. And sometimes they randomise a bit in the opening things as well. Anyway, then I was talking about how basically machines beat us, not because they're better than us at playing chess, but because we make mistakes. And I eventually reached this diagram here on the right, and I'm going to now go to chess space, and I'm going to load, I did actually move column 125, which is what it is down here. And there's a position in Carson Nakamura. I was actually watching the commentary um, on chess 24. And I noticed a move here. It's a disgusting move because it gives up a bishop for a knight and takes away all the pressure. But it happens to win a move. And I, I did notice it. I stuck it in the chat. Obviously it was drowned out by everything else. But bishop takes d5 wins a pawn. Because if you take it with the port with the queen, you go knight f6 check and queen takes. Well, actually, either queen checks or even better is actually this, isn't it? This just causes a major, major accident, like checkmate and two or three more moves. If he takes with either pawn, then you go knight f6 check. It doesn't matter which pawn. Takes, takes. And because of the threat of queen g4 check or queen g3 check, you win the queen. So you have to take with the knight, and then white can take a pawn. Now you've given up quite a big advantage in order to gain that pawn, but perhaps you should do it. I don't know if Carson noticed this, because it looks a bit anti-positional to give up this 
advantage um, so for so apparently so little. But maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. And it's interesting that um, he didn't do this. This is the game he lost against Nakamura in the, I think it's his quarterfinal of the Lindora's Abbey tournament. I'm just wondering whether you can play Queen d7 now and try to do something with knight b6 after rook c4. Or maybe f6 first and then um, knight b6. I don't know. It's not that important the absolute truth about it. What is interesting is that there's a move which is a little bit anti-positional, which wins a pawn, and that's something a machine sees instantly, and probably we see more instantly now than we used to, or much better now, because we've been taught to look for these moves. The moves that people miss are normally the moves you wouldn't play in any circumstances except that they win outright. There are horrible moves which happen to win. If they win, then of course you want to play them. I mean, why wouldn't you play a winning move? It's just that clearly um, you try not to do it if you can avoid it, um, to, to give up a good piece for a bad piece. So I'm just replacing this, and I will be sending a replacement PGN to chess base in a bit. So we'll go back to this column. Then I said, in the same tournament, Kadiakin, after losing the first game against Daniel Dubov in their quarter-final, decided as black to give the exchange for long-term pressure. And this is an interesting position. Um, now the question is, White's just gone Queen C2. He could have gone uh, Rook B1, I suppose, if he's really worried, and if Queen B4, Rook, the other Rook to C1. Now would you let black play Rook takes E3 in this position? Um, it's something that happens quite often. Black plays rook takes e3 to s smash white's pawn structure. And he's a whole exchange down. But it's playable. If I, I've got Houdini is the engine I use most. I know it's not one of the chess space particularly pushes. And um, if I look at this and turn on the engine, then actually I think rook e3 is one of the moves it suggests quite soon. It's not at the moment, in fact. Let's give it a little while. Still not, in fact. So it's not a move it wants to. But the last time I tried, presumably it was in a slightly different state. Now it's got rookie three. And it's saying that's not a bad move. So let's... Um, the question is again, sorry, I should have... Is whether you'd allow rookie three and how you feel about this move. Personally, I don't like being the exchange up with a really crap position. And I would try to avoid this. On the other hand, and I remember sort of games, blitz games against Armenian punks where they um, took, where they gave up the exchange. And it was deeply unpleasant for a long time while I was trying to, I can't remember which one it was. It was one of the guys gave up the exchange and nearly beat me. And I think I swindled him in the end. It's only a blitz game, but it sort of st sticks in the mind as something that, you know, not the sort of thing I like to allow to happen. But other people, I mean, Victor Korchner would probably say, ooh, I'm the exchange up, what a delight. And there are other people who are very materialistic who would really be very happy to be the exchange up here. So it's a question, of course, there's also a question of um, actually analysing it and deciding what's going on. But um, it is something you just have to decide yourself how you feel about this. What actually happened was that eventually uh, we've gone on a long way. Uh, Dubov was able to give up the exchange himself and because he had the white squared bishop he killed the guy. And this led to blood on the tracks and a nice victory. Um, okay, something awful happened. If rook takes bishop you play d7 in this position clearly and win, and he won very fast. And round about here is mate in a couple of moves, so he won. So that was just an interesting question. It's about how um, you choose moves, which is basically what I ended up doing. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing when I started writing this column. I knew I'd started talking about being Nigel second. I wasn't sure how I was going to wrap it up. And then I went to, I started talking about Nigel again, saying, well, he got splattered by Kasparov. Actually, this was in anti Marshalls, is what happened at the start of this match. But later on, he fought really hard. And he did get some wonderful positions with these absolutely insane 
um, Nidovs, he was able to fight really hard. So that was interesting because um, you'd have thought that somehow, um, you know, Kasparov is so good at these, but Nigel was very, very brave. So I said I, I wasn't really very brave against Kasparov at all when I played him. I used to play d4 and play various kings indians and usually i lost though i drew some games when i impersonated trickster the mythological character who winds people up and does outrageous things i drew one really awful position against him once and i said that i really enjoyed we go then to this this game um i'm not going to give the full games it's really the point is that we got to this position and here i played the splendid move bish b3 and in my book, which is just behind me, I should have got it before, I said something like, Kasparov was really surprised by this move. I'm sorry we're having a fight with a chair now. This is extra content for the viewers. Um, I've got a plastic sheeting down there to um, defend the floor against the um, bottom of the chair. And sometimes the bottom of the chair gets stuck there, which is a great joy for all mankind. And um, now where is the Kasparov game? Um, GK it must be, presumably, or I say Kasparov, probably I did. Here we are, game 26, page 150. This is in my great, my best games book. In fact, it's more just a general book of interesting games, not necessarily best ones. And um, yeah. If you can see this position, I don't know if you can, it's disgusting against Kasparov in the Naras 1991, but I managed to draw, which is a complete scandal. And this one I said, um, blah, 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 blah. Kasparov returned to the board. Um, if, if my previous moves caught something of reaction, this was altogether in a different league. His eyebrows arched and he sank into the deep thought. And played very well and very nearly beat me afterwards. Um, you can see the game in the um, in the article. Basically what happened was he played F takes, which is a good move. Um, we played some moves. I got into trouble, but it, we were both in time trouble there now, which is a credit to me because I'd actually really wound the guy up, the world champion up. Well done, me. And in this position he played the awful move c5 when rook b8 one move as he says would have won a pawn and given me a clear advantage what actually happened was that i went bishop c6 i probably had almost no time at this moment we got some ending and i managed to draw it what i would say about gary is that he's was you know the best player well, i'm not sure if that Ivan, was possibly i thought Ivan might have been even better than Karpov kasparov but Gary got one ending so so rarely, he normally bashed you long before then, that I wasn't sure he was actually that good at endings. I mean, he was wonderful at, you know, everything else. But he but he, he didn't really need to win one endings very often. So there, I'd probably have been more upset playing Korchnoi in this position than him. That's a bad move because it, um, it allows Black to liquidate the king side. Now I can go here. And the important thing is that if takes, takes, here, here... You draw by a tempo. You get your king to f8. And you draw. And we drew a little quite soon thereafter. So this was me being trickster at the end. And also I really enjoyed, I assume I really enjoyed playing bishop b3. I can't imagine I didn't. Because it's, it's nice to wind the world champion up, you know. I mean, okay. I also said I liked playing Gary. I mean, the thing is, you were either intimidated or you weren't. I thought, OK, the guy will normally beat me, or very often beat me, but it's nice to play the world champion. And also, I didn't mind him, you know, being quite emotional, because I thought he's given me an assessment. Here I am, I'm playing chess, it's a really difficult game, I don't really quite know what's going on, and the best player in the world is telling me he has the advantage or he doesn't. Normally he'll be making a happy face, which is a shame, you know, it'd be better if he was making a sad face, but we can survive. And occasionally he'll be making a sad face. And then, you know, I'm getting an assessment from the world champion, which is encouraging for me. So, um, then we come to the fourth game, we go back to the article. I said, um, yeah, basically I normally got bashed by him, but I did beat him once. 
um, in this rather awful game, which I didn't even include in my book because it was such an awful game in many ways. And I'll show you. I played it after I, I was on holiday in Shetland, um, which is somewhere off the north um, east coast of England. Sorry, I'm bad about east and west. I have to do something with my hands to do this. And um, I came back from holiday. I played this tournament at um, the Athenaeum Club. It was called the, I don't know, European Speed Championship or something. And I played Gary. And I thought, well, I'm probably going to lose, so let's do something and wind the guy up. And we'll have it from my point of view. I played Leningrad Dutch. I don't think I've played it apart from that. I did say, I once played the Christmas tree against Jan, against Jan Timmen, where you um, play E6 as well. So you have a Christmas tree of pawns like this. And I'm, okay, D6 is what was played. Um, and um, I didn't know what I was doing. I got a bad position extremely quickly. I think I should go e5 now, shouldn't I? And queen e7. e5 pawn takes pawn, I'll pass on queen e7. But of course I didn't know what I was doing, and I got a really rubbish position. That's a horrible move. But, you know, I'd wound, wound Gary up a great deal, which was a good thing. And I almost managed, well... That's a good move, breaking me up, and I took. And unfortunately, the exchange sacrifice, now he gets the queens off. Now, I think um, he played rook f1 here. Rook g4 check and rook f1 looks scarier to me. I think the engine is reasonably unimpressed. But the basic problem is that there's this pawn still. And um, that's a big deal. If you get some position when you're playing the exchange down. If they get a passed pawn outside your position, that's a problem. Maybe it's not such a problem when it's the G pawn. If it was an H pawn, it'd be a terrible problem. But I feel that this is better. I don't think, I think Houdini itself, in its great wisdom, thinks I'm okay here. No, it's giving plus equals at least. Um, I mean, black wins a lot of pawns, but then eventually white tries to advance the G pawn and destabilize and get the advantage. And it's difficult you need the the knight once the g and h pawns come off then the knight is fantastic on sort of e5 it defends almost all of the structure but um before it does then it's it's not so good anyway he gary played um we got to this position and now he didn't take because now the board is smaller i'm probably okay and we hacked away and he got this one but i'm still fighting because a rook and a knight are not much worse than two rooks. It's just that um, you just have to do your stuff, get on with it. Um, I, I probably missed rook b3, actually. I, it's the sort of move I tend to miss, because co moves backwards. He, he Gary was very good at moves backwards with rooks, or moves with rooks to, defended by pawns. I don't know, something... Anyway, this happened, and I gave check. He should have gone back with his king, but he went king h4, and I went there. And suddenly he's in deep trouble, because I'm threatening checkmate in one move with the rook h3. So he has to give check, and his rooks are all over the place, and he can't really defend here. I mean, rook endings are completely hopeless. Rook takes knight, king takes rook. He can, if he wants, play rook c6 and hope, well, even then c5, check, king c3 is going to be winning. Because basically I'm going to win with a C-pawn very easily. He tried this. I went check in there. And he's just, his rooks are a complete nightmare. I'm threatening knight e4. So he played some move with a rook. And then he gave up. So this is the only time I've actually beaten Gary. Um, it's not a great game. But of course I was very, very happy with it at the time. And I think I beat Mickey as well in this tournament, didn't I? I beat Mickey in this tournament as well. I think I did, Michael Adams, and actually won it, <coughs> which was a bit amazing. I mean, because normally I, I lost to Mickey horribly. Um, so there we are. So, But the thing is that in all the diagrams which I've highlighted in the article, I made decisions that I wanted to. Um, okay, I, I've highlighted the diagram where I won this, but 
I played an opening I wanted to, even though I didn't particularly understand it, although I clearly didn't understand it much at all. I play, um, and then I played Bish B3, which I really wanted to once I realised it was playable. It was almost irresistible. It was almost impossible not to play the move once you saw it was a legal move. You just couldn't couldn't bear not to, really, or I couldn't. And, um, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, I try not to be self-indulgent in my choice of moves, but sometimes there is a move you really want to play, so you should do it. The one thing you mustn't do when you're playing chess is to not play a move which you think you want to play and you think may be best because you're playing a strong opponent. You cannot think, oh, he's so good, he must have seen this move. Because grandmasters make glorious errors a lot of the time, as you can now see online repeatedly. I mean, thinking the opposite, that grandmasters always play badly because, because the engines go ping, is an equally stupid thing to do. You shouldn't believe either that the engines, either that grandmasters aren't very good at chess, or that we are so stupid that we make errors all the time. You should just believe we're human and that things happen. And if you see a move and you can't refute it, then try to refute it if it looks too good to be true. But if you just can't refute it, then get on with it and play your move. Don't let yourself be put off by the belief that there must be something wrong with it. Because often there isn't. And even if there is, if it's the move... Sometimes you have to play a move even if you think it loses. I mean, there are times when your position is, is bad and really the only thing you can do is to bluff. Um, it may not may not be, you know, perfect chess. And a machine, you know, you see these machines in lost positions. They used to just start jettisoning pieces merrily and saying, so, 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 so they had no poker face at all. But actually, you just have to do what you want to do. And these four games um, are showing that, I hope. So I hope you've enjoyed this column. Um, I'm touting for... Sorry, that's a completely... Why am I going there? I should be going to... That was just my news feed. Um, it's the BBC, of course. Um, why... Um, I've been toting on my um, stream, which is twitch.tv forward slash John Spielman. The end of streams, I've been toting for ideas for these columns. One guy suggested some Mikhail Tal games. That sounds like a very good idea to me indeed, and I'll probably do it at some point. And other people have made other suggestions. And if you have a suggestion which gets used, then um, I will see to it that you get a three-month uh, premium suggestion, a premium um, account from from Chessbase. Blah, blah, blah. So um, please do send in suggestions. If you want to, then let me just, um, I'll just put down, so this is my email. It, uh, it's different from what it used to be. It's jonathan at jspielman.co.uk. Uh, Spielman.co.uk was already taken. I had to lose my previous account, which was Demon. And as I said, if you want to ever watch me streaming, which is about once a week, um, then it's at twitch.tv forward slash John Spielman. So, um, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I am going to stop it now. And I will be back on in a fortnight with a column for presumably July the 17th. Okay, bye then.